On the 30th day of October, Halloween gave to me 30 pod people howling, 29 cosmic vampires, 28 Bruce's bleeding, 27 monster elevators, 26 Busey's haunting, 25 Isabel's freaking, 24 Vincent's farming, 23 Cushing's ghouling, 22 Ruggers glaring, 21 babies killing, 20 horse head snorting, 19 D's renting, 18 Frank's perving, 17 angel stripping, 16 demons jazzercising, 15 runes on parchment, 14 Joseph's whispering, 13 seniors bleeding, 12 creepy masks, 11 dancing demons, 10 Catholic monsters, 9 priests of miracling, 8 Jerry's vamping, 7 Jody's oinking, 6 body swapping, 5 reeds of wolfing, 4 drunken uncles, 3 werewolf colonies, 2 spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Well, hey there, everyone. Welcome to Saturday, October 30th, the uh, penultimate episode of our 31 Days of Halloween. And, you know, I like to think that we kind of saved the best for last in this last week. You know, we talked about Cabin in the Woods and Evil Dead and Horror Express and Motel Hell and Possession, all these terrific movies. And now we land on the last couple that I wanted to talk about uh, for this 31 Days of Halloween. So the rules, as you may or may not know, are just that for each of these 31 days that I do every year, I just can't repeat a movie. And so when I'm making my list, I'm thinking, especially in the last week, what are the movies that really get under my skin and kind of bother me? And not in the, you know, hey, get away from me, you bother me, kid. Not that W.C. Fields kind of thing, but the the kind of movies that make me uncomfortable to watch because they get at something in the core of me that I find unsettling. And The Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978 is one of the most frightening movies of all time to me. And I I like all of them, pretty much. Uh, The Body Snatchers one is maybe my least favorite of all the adaptations, and The Invasion with uh, Daniel Craig, maybe not so great. But I, they're still watchable. And Invasion of the Body Snatcher 78, is it, it has an outstanding pedigree. It's written by W.D. Richter, who would go on to uh, be a writer for Big Trouble in Little China. Um, he's a uh, brewbaker. He did that L- Frank Langella Dracula. Uh, you know, it, it, really good writer. And then it's directed by Philip Kaufman, who directed The Right Stuff and Unbearable Lightness of Being and a really interesting, creative director. And so you put those two together and then you give them a cast that is filled out with like Jeff Goldblum and Donald Sutherland, who is amazing, uh, Brooke Adams and Veronica Cartwright and Leonard Nimoy. And I mean, just cover to cover, everywhere you look, there's a good actor at work in this movie. You even get a cameo from Kevin McCarthy from the original 56 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which I dearly love because when you see him, he's kind of doing his shtick uh, from the end of that movie. So it's almost like, well, this movie in some ways sort of picks up where that one left off, where uh, in Invasion of the Body Snatchers uh, 56, it was like, well, they're, they're coming. And in 78, they're definitely here. And... The thing that I find frightening about this movie is the slow burn of it, of knowing, okay, something is kind of going wrong here. Um, And then by the time you realize how wrong it's gotten, it's sort of too late. And and, and so the broad strokes of this movie are this, that there is this uh, creature, these creatures, this entity that basically drifts through space that's the opening of the movie is seeing these sort of uh threads space goo floats from one planet down to earth and once it gets here it forms a plant-like thing that uh, that sort of grows on um other plants it's a sort of a, a parasite and one day uh brooke adams uh playing elizabeth driscoll she sees that uh, one of these plants is there and, and picks it up. She's a bit of a an amateur 
green thumb and wants to take a look at this. Thinks it's a Grex, which is a, a plant formed when two species of plants uh, sort of cross-pollinate and make something new. And so she takes it home with her. And unbeknownst to her, it is actually a, a pod. Uh, what can make a different version of you that has all your memories and thoughts and that kind of thing. It just doesn't have any of the emotion. And it's it, it's just a different entity. It knows everything about you and it can pretend to be you, but it's not really you. And that's what happens to her husband. All of a sudden, she wakes up one day and her husband just isn't the person that he was. And she ends up working for Donald Sutherland, who is a deputy health inspector, and goes to him to say, like, hey, my husband ain't my husband anymore. And he says, all right, all right, that's a little crazy. So why don't I take you to a friend of mine who is uh, a psychiatrist and has written a bunch of books and played by Leonard Moy, Dr. Kibner is his name. And so he takes uh, Brooke Adams to Dr. Kibner, Leonard Moy. And Leonard Des Moines says, you know, I've been getting a lot of this this week. And what it is is that, you know, we live in changing times. We're more distant from one another. Yada, yada, yada. A lot of psychobabble. Uh, Jeff Goldblum is at this same party where Donald Sutherland first introduces Brooke Adams to Leonard Des Moines. And Jeff Goldblum, as always, a delight in this film. He's a, a writer, but he's not necessarily... Uh, super successful, and he's more of an artist than uh, his friend Dr. Kibner, who is more into New Age psychology and so forth. And there's a little bit of teasing on the part of, I think, Philip Kaufman about that kind of New Age psychobabble. And so Jeff Goldblum uh, is, is one of our other characters. He and Veronica Cartwright are... I don't know that they're married. They may just be boyfriend, girlfriend. Doesn't matter. No, they are married. Sorry. And anyway, he and Veronica Cartwright, who plays his his wife, Nancy, um, run or work at uh, this sort of mud bath joint. And so one night uh, after this party, he is laying down on the job and Veronica Cartwright discovers this pod that is slowly becoming Jeff Goldblum. Uh, she calls Donald Sutherland, and he realizes, oh, wow, there really is something going on. So we kind of have our core group of four heroes, um, along with Dr. Kibner, who we, you know, even if you haven't seen this movie, pretty early on you suspect that maybe he's up to no good and is actually a pod person, which is how it turns out. And from that point, it's just them trying to figure out what's going on and learning that hey, if you go to sleep, that's when they get you. And, which is genius, I think. They're trying to stay awake. They're trying to stay away from these other people. And they realize, oh my God, there are way more of them now than there seem to be of us, of normal people. The, the pod people now outnumber the, the human beings in this movie. And that, to me, is the terrifying thing about the movie, is that... By the time you realize, oh, here's what's going on. If we go to sleep, these pods make copies of us, and then we end up just drying up into these desiccated husks. And then they go about the business of being us, only they're not quite us. They don't quite get it right. And so you can kind of tell who's who. But by the time we realize that, oh, shit, it's too late. They're already in control of... The government of, of the town, they're already spreading this infection, these pods, everywhere that they can. We're just on the, the precipice of world takeover. And so it becomes less about being, you know, the scrappy heroes who are going to save the day than pure survival. And I think the, the scenes that maybe work best for me, that creep me out the most, are these little moments when you realize, like, oh shit, they've got their their fingers and everything like there's a great moment where uh donald sutherland after they uh, almost get got by the pod people by falling asleep at his place he wakes up and he calls the police and before he can give a name they say we're on our way mr driscoll and or uh mr benell 
And he's like, wait a second, I didn't give you my name. And some other people around him are like, hey, man, we got to go. Like, there are people coming down the street for us. And he gets stuck on that. He repeats, I, I never told her my name. And it's that moment of realization of like, oh, my God, they're, you know, the phone operator is a pod person. Uh, my buddy Leonard Nimoy is a pod person that we we're just surrounded. We're we're the only ones left. We're much like I am legend. We're the unusual creature here. We are the minority. And it is horrifying. And I've said this before on a number of podcasts and so forth, that one of the central fears that I have is kind of irrational. But the idea that you can be sort of absorbed, like you you can be replaced by something that looks like you and talks like you and walks like you, but it ain't you. And it's it, uh, th this fear that I've always had about losing your own agency, you know, uh, being possessed and being a passenger in your own body. That get out kind of thing uh, also touches on that for me of uh, the sunken place where you can kind of see out your own eyes, but you're not in control of anything. And Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a step up from that where not only uh, are you unable to to control yourself it's that you've been completely replaced other people would think it was you if they didn't know you too well but if they did they would realize oh there is no more Bo Bo has been replaced by a pod person and the real Bo is just gone and you know it, that ties into my fears of like you know mental decline and older age and stuff like that it's just the idea of what I am now my, my own sentience is either consumed by something or fades away or is replaced by something. My own agency, my own thoughts and feelings and the, the person I am, what makes me me. Um, and and that, I think, is what, what's so terrifying about the movie. And it works because Philip Kaufman and W.D. Richter are just absolute geniuses at ratcheting up the tension more and more and more until you you truly are at a place where there is no escape. You know, they're uh, one of the other uh, Body Snatcher remakes. I think it was Body Snatchers. There's a great line that Meg Tilly has in that movie where when they're trying to get away, Meg Tilly says, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And that's without putting that fine a point on it in this movie. That is definitely the vibe is what are you going to do? Where are you going to go to escape this? You can't. And worse, the one thing that we all need to do to keep from dying and or going crazy is sleep. And sleep is where they get you. And I don't know that there's a, a more vulnerable time in your life than when you're unconscious. And, it, you know, it's something like uh, something I discovered recently. It's just, you know, it's been a while since I was sleeping with some somebody on the regular. I don't mean sexually. I just mean like sleeping in their bed, right? And it takes a few times to get used to that, of of the rhythms of that. And there is something vulnerable about being asleep with someone. And more so when you think, oh, not only am I super vulnerable when I'm going to sleep, but it's also that, hey, when I go to sleep, I know for sure something is coming for me. But how do you stop it? How do you stop yourself from doing the the one thing that we all must do at least every so often just so that we recharge our brains and all that. Um, I also really like when they're trying not to sleep uh, Brooke Adams finds some speed that she knows one of the guys in the health department uses and she says well how many should we take and Donald Sutherland asks well how many does he take and she says one. He says well take five um, I think that's really funny and there are some funny moments in this Jeff Goldblum is very funny uh, as this artist trying to kind of piece together what's going on. And he's got a great bit where he's complaining to some stranger at a Litter Des Moines party that this guy churns out a book every six months. And it sometimes it takes me six months just to pick one word. And she goes, why? Uh, and he says, why am I talking to you? I don't even know you. Uh, it, but it's it's filled with little moments that are very human and very natural. And so when you see those like human moments replaced by 
these very matter of fact. Like once Jeff Goldblum gets God, um, he doesn't have that same kind of kinetic energy. He's just very. He he still looks and and talks like Jeff Goldblum, but he's missing that spark. And uh, again, it's great to see a lot of actors being able to kind of play those roles where one moment they're, you know, kind of fun loving, easy going people to one degree or another, and then once they've been replaced they're just not quite the same and it's a neat trick it's a it's a good acting trick yeah you know the the movie nods towards the or, the original 56 invasion of the body snatchers without completely ripping it off but having kevin mccarthy show up is uh, a really wonderful moment and it's also one of the first moments you realize how many of the pod people there are now because when he uh, gets run down there's just a crowd kind of surrounding him. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the last shot of this movie, which is one of the most horrifying things that I've ever seen in film, where Donald Sutherland is going about his day in this world of pod people, and you don't know if he's Donald Sutherland or not. You know, you just know that he is walking among the pod people, and you also know that he has enough knowledge that he can sort of blend in with them. And he's doing normal Donald Sutherland stuff. If he's not showing any emotion, well, that's understandable because he can't show emotion among these people. And so he's walking uh, past a bunch of, you know, skeletal looking trees and Veronica Cartwright comes up to him uh, and is like, Matt, Matt, I made it. I, you know, I've been able to kind of live among them. And he points at her and gives the pod people screech to indicate, oh, there's a human. And it's terrifying. The movie goes out with, hey, the, this guy, our hero of the movie, Matt Bennell, is now uh, one of them and is turning on his friends because, well, it's not him. It's the pod person turning on his friends. Uh, but it's terrifying. And... One of the first movies I remember seeing as a kid where the good guys didn't win. That it totally ends in a place of, oh, well, we're just all completely fucked. And that was also really disturbing to me at the time I saw it. And when I watch it, it still bothers me because I like these characters. It bums me out when they go, when Brooke Adams gets replaced in Donald Sutherland's arms and her body just kind of collapses into nothing. It's really disturbing and, and unpleasant and sad. Um, there's that great effect with uh, the dog homeless guy who plays the banjo uh, that I really love. In fact, I use as the show art for this. But it, it's just, I mean, cover to cover, there's not a point in this movie that I think gets it wrong. I think the, the biggest drag in the movie is towards the end when you're kind of blowing up the pod people facility and Donald Sutherland is running away and I you know I think that matters because you want to see him strike a blow against uh, these things but also you learn pretty fast that it doesn't really matter it doesn't have uh, much of an effect if at all and perhaps that's the point of it is just to show that hey this guy gives best effort and it's all for naught but there's a nihilism to Invasion of the Body Snatchers that uh, I find deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, and it's not nihilism in for the sake of nihilism. It, it's just, it's just what this story is, and and drives home like those moments when Donald Sutherland is holding Brooke Adams in his arms as she can no longer stay awake, and he just repeats over and over, "I love you, I love you." And it's this declaration of humanity in the face of, of inhumanity that is surrounding them. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's such a wonderful movie. It's just the best. It's one of the best horror movies ever made. And it still freaks me the hell out. And watching it again for this list of 31 movies, I still found myself deeply uncomfortable watching. I was like, Ugh, I, ju I don't like how almost human these characters are that it, it again just a pitch perfect tone it gets it just right and because it gets it just right it's scary as hell
Um, all right, so that's Invasion of the Body Snatchers 1978. I hope you enjoyed my reminiscence about how much this movie bothers me to my core. Uh, and let me know how you make out with it. Uh, I find it uh, terrifying. Um, so we've got only one more. we got one more day. And, you know, I like to think I'm saving the best for last, but we'll see. We'll see what you think about it. You can always catch me uh, on Legion Podcasts on uh, Twitter. Uh, you can find Legion Podcasts on Facebook and Instagram. So just leave a message over there. Uh, let me know what you think. And also, if you want to have an ongoing conversation with me, and God bless you if you do, um, you can find me on Facebook at the Dark Parade Facebook group, uh, which is my main horror podcast, as well as Dark Parade Pod on Twitter. Um, and I think that's going to do it for now. So I know it's Saturday. If you're working, do good work. If you're not working, hey, uh, you got Halloween decorating to do. If you haven't done it yet, make sure you got plenty of candy. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow for Halloween. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>